Good morning, Council. The next case is McKenzie and Olden versus the Department of Corrections, the State of Michigan, and the Macomb Correctional Facility Warden. Um, this is also a, oh, this is a 20-minute argument um, per side. Um, who's going first? Mr. <laughs> Asbinson. Yes. You may reserve time, but we ask you to try and keep track of that. Whenever you're ready, you may proceed. Madam Chief Justice, and may it please the court, I am Assistant Attorney General Ken Delaz Benson, and I'm joined at council table by Eric Rustusha and Adam DeBear. I represent the state defendants, and I would like to reserve three minutes for rebuttal. Neither the Court of Claims nor the Circuit Court have jurisdiction to hear Rehabilitation Act or ADA claims against the state of Michigan. This is true for three reasons. The first is that since statehood, Michigan has been immune from suit unless it waives that immunity but it has not done so for the two relevant federal statutory claims. And it's beyond Congress's Article I power to abrogate immunity for these claims. The Court of Claims Act is the controlling legislative expression of Michigan's waiver of sovereign immu immunity because there has been no wa waiver of this immunity, the exception to the Michigan uh, Circuit Court's general jur jurisdiction does not apply, and the circuit courts do not have jurisdiction to hear these federal statutory claims. My second point is that the text of the Court of Claims Act itself um, provides that this is the case. The Court of Claims has jurisdiction over all claims against the state, and we see this in Section 6419. But Section 6421, which does not apply to this particular case, sends some claims to the circuit courts. We see in Section 6440 that there are claims that are prohibited when there's an adequate remedy at federal law. And this stands in contrast to 6421, which sends claims to the circuit courts. 6440 does not send claims to the circuit courts. And in fact, Section 6452 anticipates that these claims will be filed with the federal courts. My third point is that Alden versus Maine is the appropriate analysis for this case not the supremacy clause analysis as proposed by plaintiffs. However, even if this court thinks that there's some trouble with the supremacy clause, the appropriate action would be to strike 6440 um, and allow these claims to proceed in circuit court, or excuse me, in the court of claims. Can you, counsel, can you, um, in your brief, you, you provide us with a number of cases where um, the state maintains sovereign immunity um, as exception to circuit court general jurisdiction, and they all involve state law. Um, do you, can you give me a site of a case in which the state is able to assert sovereign immunity uh, for federal law, federal claims? Yes, um, I would point this court to Alden versus Maine um, as one, as well as the, um, the Garrett case involving the ADA itself. Both of those claims, there were um, federal um, statutes that were at issue, but the states, and specifically in Alden versus Maine, it was the FLSA, the Fair Labor Standards Act. It was a federal act, and the state of Maine was immune from suit in its own courts under that act. Okay, thank you. So, I feel like the briefing in this case talked past each other. I mean, I, I understand, I don't really understand sovereign immunity, I take it back. I don't understand it at all. I don't even know what it is. I don't know if it's like, I, I don't know how to categorize it. But um, but, but it, it, it's not the case that there's, that we don't have to try and figure out how they do interact. And there's, you know, 100 years of supremacy law that says, especially, I mean, directly on point in Howlett and Testa that when the state court allows a comparable um, state law claim, which there is for both the ADA claim and the Rehabilitation, Rehabilitation Act claim, which the state allows in circuit court, um, that it's not a neutral state rule to not permit the, the, the federal claims to proceed. So, I mean, do we just have to like look the other way on that 100 years of supremacy law that says we, we have to allow that? I don't, I don't understand what to do with that. Absolutely not. And I would direct this court specifically to page 740 of the Alden versus Maine decision where it addresses Howlett. Um, and all, obviously, Alden versus Maine was prior to the Haywood case. But I think you're talking both about the Haywood and the Howlett cases. 
and 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 a bunch of other cases. I mean, Correct. you know, in Testa specifically. I mean, there are cases where if the state court allows um, suit for the similar state claim, the supremacy clause says it it it, it also has to allow the, the federal claim, which but, makes sense in terms of you know how people go about litigating these issues, right? But not when it relates specifically to that uh, to the state. Both Howlett and um, Haywood address issues that uh, address claims that were brought under 1981, and these are claims against individuals. These are not claims against the actual state of Michigan or or, or the state that issue in those cases. And so under Haywood and Howlett, um, you have individual claims against individuals. Here in the present case, you actually have a claim against the state of Michigan itself, um, and that's the Rehabilitation Act. And then you have a claim that is, according to um, Will versus MSP, is exactly like a claim against the state itself. It's an official capacity claim. In both Haywood and um, Howlett, what you had were individual claims, and the state was trying to go beyond the sovereign immunity and cloak individuals within with sovereign immunity, which it doesn't have the authority to do. The present case is distinguishable, and you can see that in the Alden case, where <clears throat> the United States Supreme Court in 1999 said that states retain immunity from private suit in their own courts, and this immunity is beyond the congressional power to abrogate under Article I legislation. Now, there are exceptions, as we noted in, I believe it was footnote six of our brief, with regard to a constitutional ex parte young claim. There is federal, um, <clears throat> jurisdic uh, federal jurisprudence, um, specifically General Oil versus Crane, which um, applies for federal constitutional ex parte young claims to be brought in the state court. But again, a waiver of sovereign immunity is, has to be um, interpreted in, by its terms. Um, it can't, it doesn't mean anything beyond what it says. The Rehabilitation Act says that states are allowed to be sued in federal court. It does not say state court in the, in the actual text of the legislation. And so that waiver when Michigan accepts funds, that waiver of sovereign immunity is limited to the federal courts. It's not an extension to then be able to bring these claims in state court. And the same applies when you view um, the Board of Trustees versus Garrett case. Um, footnote nine of that case provides that the federal recourse is injunctive relief under an ex parte young claim. It's a statutory claim. The, and going back to Alden versus Maine, with regard to the ADA, um, the ADA is a um, statutory claim that is passed pursuant to Congress's Article I legislative power. And according to Alden versus Maine, Congress doesn't have the ability to waive the state's sovereign immunity in its own courts. The states have created, the state of Michigan has created its courts, and um, by the fact that it has created those courts, it is not subject to those courts unless it specifically authorizes um, itself to be sued in those courts. The Court of Claims Act was that act that authorized that. Council, I have a question. This is more just like a practical, how, does the, how has this worked in the past question? I'm wondering, before this case, mm -hmm. um, I, did the state, I mean, obviously it's here because it's an issue that's new and we have to decide it. That's obviously why we're here. Um, but what I'm wondering is, in the past, when uh, plaintiffs with similar claims, we can just say, against MDOC, um, made a similar claim, um, did they go to federal court? Or is this, have, have, do we have a history of people going to circuit court filing these claims? Um, from my experience, I have not seen a history of these federal claims being pursued in state court. Um, primarily, they go to the federal courts. Um, and um, <clears throat> So all the litigation against the wardens on behalf of the women prisoners that resulted in millions of dollars of verdicts and the juvenile lifers that resulted in millions of dollars of verdicts that were litigated in state courts, what was that about? Those were brought under, if I'm not mistaken, under the Elliott Larson Civil Rights Act primarily. Um, I'm not intimately familiar with that case, but that's my recollection, is that they were brought under the Elliott Larson Civil Rights Act. And within different Michigan um, Civil Rights Acts, specifically that one, but also the Persons with Disabilities Civil Rights Act and the Whistleblower Protection Act, those within the actual text of the acts have exceptions that permit you to sue the state within the circuit courts. The state is defined as a person, and then the act itself also authorizes suit 
in the circuit courts. And so that is the exception, or excuse me, that is what gets you past the sovereign immunity argument with respect to those statutory, state statutory claims and allows you to bring those suits in the circuit courts. But without that statutory exception, you would be stuck in the, um, in the court of claims. So it, it, in those cases where the litigants had a state claim and a federal claim, they could have their state jury trial claim and get their verdict and then have a federal jury trial claim and get a verdict there as well? Yes, those, those two suits can, can exist simultaneously. And what about the issue of collateral estoppel or sort of confusion between conflicting uh, venues on the same facts? Um, there could be potentially collateral estoppel. Um, one case could decide the other. Um, that would just conserve judicial resources, though. Won't that only occur if the federal court declines pendant jurisdiction of the state claims? I'm not exactly sure of the question. Well, if you bring if you bring it in federal court and you bring state claims, they can they have pendant court jurisdiction. They can they can hear the state law claims because they're tied and brought with a federal claim. Now, oftentimes the federal courts will decline to exercise pendant jurisdiction, but but more often than not, because they're the same issues, they take them together. They can take them together. The state can assert sovereign immunity in federal court for the state claims. And then they bear the risk of a determinative question of fact being decided against them in the federal court, which would bar their, their a state claim. Correct. And so the waiver of immunity is limited to specifically what the waiver is. And under the Civil Rights Acts that are passed by the state of Michigan, that waiver of, that waiver of immunity applies to the state court cases. Without any further questions, I will go ahead and reserve my time for rebuttal. You may. You may reserve your time. Thank you. Good morning, Your Honors. May it please the Court. Andrew Lorla on behalf of the appellee, along with my co-counsel, Jim Razor. Um, this court requested supplemental briefing on two questions, uh, which answering those questions is really why we're here today. Uh, and those questions are first, whether MCL 6440 divests the Court of Claims of jurisdiction over both of the appellee's causes of action arising under federal statute. I think everyone agrees the answer to that question is yes. By that I mean we could not have filed these federal claims in the Court of Claims. 6440 expressly says if you have an adequate federal remedy, they can't be filed in the Court of Claims. And all an adequate federal remedy really means is could you have filed this in federal court? Um, so it's not subject to sovereign immunity. Congress did abrogate state sovereign immunity, 11th Amendment sovereign immunity. So uh, ADA claims, at least ex parte young ADA claims, Congress abrogated state sovereign immunity. Rehab Act claims, Congress abrogated state sovereign immunity. So we could have filed them in federal court. Uh, so 6440 applies, could not have filed these in the court of claims. The next question you asked is whether the circuit court shares concurrent jurisdiction with the federal courts over those causes of action. And the answer to that is yes. That was the crux of the Court of Appeals ruling in this case, uh, which is that only Congress can divest state courts of concurrent jurisdiction where Congress vests jurisdiction exclusively in federal courts. Things like copyright law and tax law, those are exclusive federal actions. Everything else, the state is presumed to have concurrent jurisdiction. Um, so the answers to both of those questions are yes. Uh, Justice Kavanaugh, you asked about um, the implications of uh, maintaining sovereign immunity in federal law. I think counsel's uh, suggestion about that is correct. I mean, there are situations where the state is immune under federal law, and those are situations where Congress has not abrogated the state's sovereign immunity. Um, Justice McCormick, I think your question was probably the most pertinent, which is um, you know, how do we square this with the Supremacy Clause? Because there's a litany of case law that says 
you know, the supremacy clause dictates that, as you noted, where states waive their sovereign immunity for PWDCRA disability discrimination, they cannot then refuse to hear analogous, virtually identical federal claims arising under companion federal statutes. To do so violates the supremacy clause. And we are not arguing here, nor have we ever argued in this case, that 6440 violates the supremacy clause because it doesn't foreclose the possibility of litigating cases in state court. Um, the state's interpretation that it's urging you to adopt would be violative of the supremacy clause, but as it currently exists, I mean, the way the Court of Appeals ruled, it fits squarely. And I think when we're talking about you know, what sh we should do here, the practical aspect uh, really matters. Uh, Justice Welch, you asked you know, what happens. Um, and I can tell you, we have done this. We have litigated two separate cases, one in state court for the violations of state law, one in federal court for the violations of federal law. And we did that because the plaintiffs in this case were not willing to spend several, you know, a year or two working through the appellate process to see whether they could have one case or two. In this particular case, the plaintiffs you know, were, did want to do that, which we were fortunate you know, to get us here. But in general, that's probably why this question hasn't made it here, because in the real world, people don't want to spend several years litigating a sort of esoteric uh, jurisdictional issue that's going to prevent them from you know, recovering lost wages for a couple of years. Um, so that is what happens in practice. But it shouldn't, right? I mean, think about what the state is arguing. Uh, it's not arguing that anything that happens here is going to expand or enlarge their liability, and they're still going to face you know, suit for violations of federal law. They're still going to face suit, you know, jury trials for violations of state law. It's just a matter of whether they're going to face those suits in one case or two, which is a strange position to take. I, you know, I was thinking about this last night. Why would the state want to have two separate cases? I mean, it's duplicative. Having done it myself, it's unnecessarily duplicative, it wastes time, it wastes money, um, it's not, there's not any meaningful benefit um, to forcing. Can't the, can't the state go ask the federal court to take the state claims and pendant jurisdiction and then they have, a, and perhaps they prefer the federal court as a place to litigate their, their claims? So the state is immune, uh, Congress cannot waive Michigan's sovereign immunity um, for violations of like the Elliott Larson Civil Rights Act, only Title VII or only the ADA. So the PWDCRA, like we've never tried to file PWDCRA or Elliott Larson Civil Rights Act claims in federal court along with federal claims because there's no jurisdiction for those claims in federal court. Because of 11th Amendment sovereign immunity, they would get kicked. I mean, the state could, let's say we filed a case, this case, I actually asked them if they wanted to do this to remove it and they did not want to do so because that would be waiving their sovereign immunity for PWDCRA liability in federal court, which they were unwilling to do. Oh, I'm even more confused, okay. <laughs> I don't blame you, I, I don't blame you. As a, like I said, as a practical matter, why you know, policy would favor severing cases like this, having litigants do two separate cases, but it doesn't really give you any meaningful benefit. Maybe it does. What if you're, you, what if you think you have a better shot in the federal court case and then you can collaterally, your state court case is collaterally stopped? I'm just trying to figure it out. Yeah, I mean, I guess if you think you have a better shot in one, you would try and like slow play that case. Right, that's what I'm thinking. Um, <laughs> yeah. but, but that's, we're talking about introducing into a scheme gamesmanship right. that is not necessary, right? I mean, and again, all of this is secondary because the supremacy clause dictates that where the Michigan legislature has waived the state sovereign immunity for suit for the PWDCRA or the L.A. Larson Civil Rights Act, the, the circuit courts are required, the state cannot prohibit the circuit courts from hearing companion federal claims under the supremacy clause. Uh, and the Court of Appeals' analysis on whether concurrent jurisdiction exists, again, which is limited to did Congress divest the state courts of concurrent jurisdiction? The answer here is clearly no. Therefore, the state court has jurisdiction, in this case, can proceed in state circuit court as one action. You don't need two separate cases. Counsel, how is it um, that Alden isn't directly on point in this case? Um, Alden involved 
federal law that's not really analogous, at least to me, in the same way. Uh, so, you know, the PWDCRA was passed shortly after the ADA, and the Rehab Act incorporates all the ADAs like definitions. So um, we're talking about two virtually analogous, almost identical statutes that have like the exact same purpose, provide the exact same constitutional protections, guarantees, rights, the same remedies. I mean, it's, it's all the same, just two different like, definitions. Um, so that is the distinguishing feature, is that, and again, the, the rule is that where you know, the state has waived its sovereign immunity for a claim in which a companion identical federal claim exists, you can't refuse to hear that federal claim in state court under the guise of sovereign immunity. That, that is um, not what the Supremacy Clause permits. Thank you. If there are no other questions, I have nothing further for you. I don't see any. Thank you very much, Council. Yeah. Why do you want to proceed in two courts? <laughs> because the state has not waived its sovereign immunity. It is entitled to that immunity. Um, and it is for the state legislature to go ahead and waive the state's sovereign immunity with regard to these claims. That is what Alden stands so for. So why don't you consent to federal court jurisdiction over the state law claims? I, I'm just saying, why do you want to proceed in two courts? What's the benefit to the state? The, the benefit is that the state is not waiving its sovereign immunity, which is something that it's had since the 1800s. Um, it is up to the state legislature to decide whether or not these claims should be brought, where these claims should be brought, and it has not consented for these claims to be brought in state court. In Alden versus Maine, specifically, it states that the decisions, the Howlett decision um, in particular, do not address the question of Congress's power to compel a state to entertain an action against a non-consenting state. Here, the state is not consenting. And so Alden, um, informs us that the court, um, that the federal government does not have the power to um, force these claims to be brought in state court. Um, and we see in the Howlett and the Haywood cases, these are claims where, or these were cases where there was uh, a 1983 claim in the um, Haywood case. It was that the state of New York was trying to prevent a certain subclass of individuals from being subject to suit under 1983. Again, it's not a claim against the state, and they were singling out corrections officers, money damages claims for corrections officers under 1983. That is clearly discriminating against certain categories of acts, and it doesn't involve a claim against the state, certain categories of 1983 actions. So it says some, some categories of 1983 actions can go forward, but others cannot. And the same is at issue in, um, in the Howlett case, where the state of Florida was allowing suits under 1983 to proceed against individual officers in their individual capacity, but not against school boards. And again, school boards are not an arm of the state. They are not the state of Florida. And so those cases did not address sovereign immunity. Alden does. And additionally, the, um, if there is some kind of issue with the supremacy clause here, if this court finds that, then the appropriate course of action would be to strike 6440 as unconstitutional because it excludes from the Court of Claims um, actions that are brought, uh, actions that can be brought in federal court. And if all of those actions must be brought in a court in the state, that must be the Court of Claims because of the jurisdictional provision of the Court of Claims, which provides that all claims against the state are to be brought within the Court of Claims. Um, unless there is this exception. If that exception is invalid, then that's what must be struck, and these claims must proceed in the court of claims, not the circuit courts. We see that every exception to the state's sovereign immunity is one where there is a specific waiver by the state legislature. We see that in the Elliott Larson Civil Rights Act, the PWDCRA, Whistleblower Protection Act, even the GTLA, uh, or the Governmental Tort Liability Act. Um, all of these have exceptions that permit suits in particular courts. Um, and it's specific. Here, there is no authorization of these federal suits to be brought in the circuit courts, and that's an exception to the circuit court's general jurisdiction. I, 
I guess I would just conclude, unless there are any further questions, with the, the only the legislature can vest jurisdiction within the circuit court over claims against the state. For years, there was not even the ability to sue in the circuit court, the state of Michigan. There was, have been limited waivers over the years, but those waivers must be strictly construed and strictly interpreted. A strict construction here um, shows that there has been no waiver for these two particular claims. And with that, I would ask that you grant and reverse the Court of Appeals, unless there are any further questions. Thank you, Counsel. Thank you both. The case will be submitted.